All right, we'll go ahead and get started and folks can trickle in as needed. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Destiny Dunbar and I'm the Community Engagement Specialist for Resources. And this is the very first installment of the North Sound Stewards Speaker Series of 2021. So we made it. Um, so for those of you who may not be a part of the North Sound Stewards program, um, North Sound Stewards is a joint effort between resources and the Whatcom Marine Resource Committee and Together, we train Whatcom County residents to go out and conduct beach surveys and collect data on our shorelines. Um, and if there are any new stewards here who may not have attended um, the speaker series before, this is just an opportunity for you all to hear from community experts about issues that impact our waterways and on topics that might be affecting some projects that you'll be working on later in the year. Um, so today we're going to be hearing from resources very own um, pollution prevention specialist Kirsten McDade and she's going to give a presentation on stormwater pollution, how to spot it, um, and how you can use the water reporter app to report pollution when you see it, especially important now in COVID when we can't go out in large groups um, and do reporting like we usually do. We have these apps, these nifty little apps, so she's going to give an overview on how to do that. Um, so just some housekeeping for the presentation. Um, it's going to be about an hour long. Um, so please keep yourself muted. Everybody's already muted. Great. Y'all are pros. Um, so we don't pick up any background noise. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat. We can just stop as question or stop for questions as needed. Um, so feel free to throw those in the chat. Um, and just know that this meeting is being recorded so that the folks who cannot attend um, will be able to watch it later. Um, and as always, be sure to log your hours on Track It Forward because this presentation and future presentations do count towards your educational hours. Um, and with that, I think we're good. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Kirsten. All right. Thanks, Destiny. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay. All right. Is that looking like presentation mode? Awesome. Great. Um, well, thanks for joining me. Um, I appreciate having an hour of your time in this afternoon. I know um, people, at least I start to get a little sleepy during this time. So anyway, just sit back and relax and you can be entertained for a little bit. I'll try to make it lively. Um, but I really want to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about, which is stormwater and um, provide you a tool that you can use to help with um, some of our stormwater problems that we have. Um, before I get into the tool, though, I want to just give a little bit of background on stormwater. All right. So um, I just want you to think about what the closest body of water is to your house. Um, this is a picture of my backyard or where my backyard leads to, and it's the West Fork of Cemetery Creek, which flows into Whatcom Creek which flows into the Bellingham Bay. Um, and if in the chat, if you could just put what you think, if you know, like maybe it's a retention pond or, um, or maybe you're on the banks of Lake Wacom, um, but where do you think your water goes from your house? All right, we have Bellingham Bay, Kendall Creek, Hannah Creek to Whatcom Creek to Bellingham Bay, specific, Lummy Bay. Awesome, mm -hmm. cool. So we have a little bit of geographic range here. That's great, okay. Um, and then, so I come to you from the Whatcom Falls neighborhood and I live and do much of my work on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples, especially Lummi and Nooksack nations. And we support tribal treaty rights and are grateful for the tribe's enduring care of the lands and waters we all rely on. And honestly, I continue to learn from the Coast Salish peoples on how to be a better steward of our environment. So I wanna just start with a very simple marine water ecosystem. And this is really a food chain. It should be a food web, but I wanna kind of simplify things here. Um, these little green dots represent the phytoplankton this little strange creature represents um, the zooplankton, which is, this one's actually a crab larva, which always amuses me. They're so 
I'm crab-like. <laughs> and then we've got forage fish, like a herring, for example. And then we've got our Chinook, our largest salmonid in the Pacific Northwest. And then, of course, the iconic orca whale. And in a marine ecosystem, we have water molecules, we have uh, salt molecules, we have dissolved oxygen and dissolved carbon dioxide. And this is what we consider the basis of a, of a natural healthy marine ecosystem. In our waters though, we also have a lot of toxics like petroleum products and we have metals and we have flame retardants. We have PCBs or polychlorinated biphenyls. We have pesticides. We have over 200 contaminants of emergent, emerging concern. We call those CECs. And, and in reality, we have thousands of different chemicals. But of those thousands of chemicals, at least 200 of them are of particular concern because they're considered persistent. They stay in the environment. They bioaccumulate in organisms. And they are toxic, meaning they cause harm. So. Um, this kind of getting back to this accumulation part process, um, the words bioaccumulate and biomagnifying are often used interchangeably and they, they are very similar, but there is a distinction. Um, and it's not super important that people totally understand that, but I think it does help understand um, the flow of toxics in our environment and why these persistent bioaccumulative toxins are of so of concern. So again, with this simple food web, these little X's represent PCBs. And PCBs have been banned in the US and in Europe since the 1970s, yet their concentrations are still increasing in the Salish Sea. So they are still having input. Um, those little X's are the PCBs. So the phytoplankton bring them in, the uh, zooplankton do, then the herring, the Chinook, and then the orca. So the accumulation factor means that when this herring eats the little crab larva, um, it gets that PCB in its body. And it does not have the mechanisms like the enzymes for the most part to break down those PCBs. So they accumulate in their bodies. And then with PCBs, it tends to be in the fatty tissue and in the liver. So you'll see that um, all these organisms have PCBs in their fatty tissues. Now the biomagnification part means that going up the food chain, the organisms that live the longest are and are the oldest, I mean oldest and live the longest, as well as being the largest, have more accumulation. So it magnifies, there's more of it. Um, so the orca has the largest amount of PCBs or other persistent toxins in them. So it's not just about orcas though. PCBs have been found in humans and particularly in human breast milk because it is rich in fat. So we don't want to separate ourselves from this marine ecosystem because we are a part of it. And they've also found that a lot of these persistent toxins are carried across land food chains as well. So they're taken up by land plants and go through the food web in that way as well. So this photo really illustrates the ramifications of biomagnification. So Lulu, this orca whale, was caught in a fishing line and is ultimately why she died. Um, she likely suffocated from being in that fishing line. But when they did a necropsy on her, they found that she was not a healthy orca whale. So she had 100 times higher levels of PCBs than are considered safe. And PCBs have known to affect reproduction, immune system, and to promote cancer. And although she was 20 years old, she had never reproduced. And orca whales usually reproduce starting around 12 years old. So it's likely that she could not reproduce. So this is a sign that the toxics in her are causing her harm. Um, these muscle watch studies um, show that it's not just about PCBs, but there's actually hundreds of toxic chemicals that are found in mussels that have been grown in the Salish Sea. So scientists place these mussels in baskets throughout the Salish Sea for about three months. Then they take them back to the lab, they grind them up, and they test them for over hundreds, for over 200 different kinds of toxic chemicals. And they found that they are uh, full of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So these are um, fossil fuels, uh, PCPs that I mentioned. DDT, which is another persistent um, chemical, but it was a pesticide that was banned quite a long time ago. 
there's metals, there's flame retardants. And interestingly enough, there's also pharmaceuticals like chemotherapy drugs and oxycodone. And the, this chemotherapy drug is a, is a relatively new discovery. And it's really concerning because this is a drug that's meant to mutate DNA. That's how it stops cancer cells from growing. So if people are to ingest this that don't have cancer, it actually acts as a birth defect because it mutates DNA. And so about 50% of the muscles in the one study the year they did it had these chemotherapy drugs in them. Oh, and I should just say the muscles that you get at Taylor Fish are not the muscles that they're using or th that you would find um, in the study. They actually use um, the muscles from Taylor Fish for their studies before they get put into contaminated waters. And they've, um, they've looked at the Taylor muscles and done um, assays of them and they are very healthy. Um, so I always, I don't want to um, stop people from eating muscles. So these um, muscles are put in um, known areas of contamination. Um, and then um, we understand because of these toxic chemicals that organisms suffer because of them. And one really good example are this, what's called this coho urban runoff mortality syndrome. So for basically over 20 years, coho have been dying in streams where they return to spawn. In some systems in years, 90% of the returning coho die. And just recently, maybe you've read about it, scientists actually isolated the chemical that is causing this pre-spawn mortality. So, which is really exciting to actually be able to identify this chemical. And it's a, um, it's a product they put on tires to prevent them from oxidizing, but it's a transformation product, meaning it's um, that product transforms into something else. And that something else, which they call 6-PPD quinone, um, that is actually what is toxic to coho. Um, they've also found that coho are very sensitive to copper pollution. And um, so I kind of see um, coho as being our canaries of the coal mine. That's why that little canary guy is there because they seem to be really good indicators of an unhealthy environment. And I think we really need to be paying attention to this. Um, there are also, there's evidence that other organisms are suffering, maybe not as acutely as the coho are, but they might have more chronic health conditions. Um, so again, we need to be paying attention to these canaries so that we can find um, these very particular toxics that are, that are um, particularly harmful. We also know that a lot of our water bodies in Washington state are not meeting the fishable and swimmable health requirements. So we have federal Clean Water Act guidelines for Washington state and we have categories one through five. Category five water bodies mean that they are not meeting these standards. So quote unquote, they're considered polluted waters that require a water improvement project. So all of these areas in red are areas in Washington state that are not meeting these basic water quality standards. In my next slide, I show a, um, just a blow up of Whatcom, Skagit and Island counties. And so here you can see um, Lake Whatcom. There's spots in Lake Whatcom that have impairments. We see the Nooksack system um, up in the north here. Um, and we also see um, Lake Samish here, which is interesting. Um, and um, anyway, you can kind of get a look at some of the different systems that you might um, be familiar with. Okay. Um, I took a look at a lot of our uh, water bodies that were those category five, and I looked for trends. And this is what I found. So in the rivers and streams, of the rivers and streams that were, uh, were assessed, the top impairments were temperature, fecal coliform, dissolved oxygen, and pH. And then our lakes, reservoirs, and ponds, um, they were PCBs, invasive species temperature, et cetera, and then ocean and near coastal areas, again, very similar to the lakes and reservoirs. We see fecal coliform, dissolved oxygen, invasive species, and we've got some toxics here as well. And so one of the things um, I wanted to point out is you notice I color coded them. There's these purple substances, which are all the toxics. Um, we only see them being impairments in our lakes, reservoirs, ponds, and our ocean areas. And I'm wondering if anyone wants to shout out in the chat why you think that these toxics are found 
being problematic in the lakes and ocean areas, but not in our rivers and streams. So yeah, just in a chat, if you have an idea of why we're seeing that trend. Rivers and streams are moving. Yeah, that's definitely a part of the story. Yes, exactly, because the streams carry the toxics to the ocean. And you think about it, the oceans are, and rivers, I mean, and lakes, to some extent, they're, they're reservoirs, they're the catchment basins, they're the big pot at the end of the fluid way. And there's often not an outlet. There's certainly not an ocean outlet. Some lakes have outlets, um, but they tend, the outlet tends to be more of that surface water that runs off. So we've got a lot of toxics that accumulate in these lakes and these ocean areas. So it's just kind of interesting to think about how not all contaminants act the same and aren't found in the same place. So it just kind of adds complexity to the problem. So when I was, um, was, when I was first hired at Resources and I was investigating um, water pollution and trying to figure out what I wanted to do and how I wanted to make the best impact, this is the type of research I was doing. And I quickly became overwhelmed, actually. Um, it's um, really depressing because I think of Washington State, I think of Bellingham as being this green, green mecca of the world. And in reality, we have a lot of pollution problems. Um, and currently, they're not getting better. Even with the Clean Water Act of, in the 1970s, we're seeing a decline over time of our water quality. So. One of the first things I did was to recognize that water pollution is a complex topic. And so just letting myself understand that and knowing that I'm one person, one position, that I'm not going to be able to tackle everything. So just letting that be, yes, it's very complicated. How can we break it apart? How can we address some of these big issues? So my next step was then to like differentiate where the pollution is coming from. And there's two main sources of our water pollution. We have our sanitary sewer water pollution. That's the stuff that's coming from our drains. It's what we flush down our toilets. It's what where we um, put down our sink. And this is where those pharmaceuticals are coming from, like the chemotherapy drugs and the oxycodone. So those are definitely coming from our sanitary sewer systems. They go to our waste, wastewater treatment plant, but they are not being filtered out. Um, our water treatment plants do an amazing job at filtering out most of the toxics, but they don't get them all, particularly these very small chemicals. So they get through. So that's kind of one side of the story is, is wrestling with sewer water. The other side of the story is storm drains. This is what is rush, uh, running off of our rooftops, um, our streets, um, our other kinds of uh, impervious, I mean, sorry, other kinds of, um, yeah, impervious surfaces, all that runoff then goes down those storm drains and then goes directly into a water body. It could be a creek, it could be a river, it could be a lake, it could be the ocean, okay? And they are virtually left untreated. And then it was pretty obvious, um, where that stormwater was getting more and more of my attention. Um, I learned that stormwater is the biggest contributor of toxic pollution to the Salish Sea, period. And so it seemed like a natural place for me to concentrate my energies. So I made the step to, to figure out, okay, how can we tackle some of these stormwater issues? Oh, my slide's going wacky. <laughs> um, and so if we look at this um, map here, we've got different types of, um, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to figure out how to get this, this animation to stop. Um, uh, uh, all right, that'll just go to Dan. Okay, and anyway, um, we've got this picture here of various forms of stormwater and um, where the pollution is coming from. So these areas in circle highlight some of those sources. So kind of starting in the upper left-hand corner here, we've got sediment. 
And the sediment that's coming from this front end loader, this excavator, I guess it's an excavator. I should know that I have two boys. This excavator here um, is um, basically kind of digging up the soil, making it loose. And then that sediment during a rain event goes into the storm drain. And that storm drain under the road that you can't see here comes out into the creek here. Excuse me, I'll go back there. Um, and then um, we've got, um, so the sediment there then contributes pollution in the sense that it can clog the gills of organisms, aquatic organisms. It can um, clog the salmon reds. So salmon build nests out of the perfectly sized rocks that have all this interstitial space that has um, oxygen in it. And so it can clog that space and basically suffocate the eggs and the baby salmon. Um, sediment also um, basically uh, provides a hitchhiking platform for other toxics. So bacteria and viruses and actually even other toxics like um, petroleum products can latch on to those pieces of sediment and they will be carried down into the waterway. We've got a picture here of someone washing a car. And so that wastewater from the car, so it's not just the soap in the water, but it's the um, tire dust that she's scrubbing off. It's the petroleum products that have been accumulating. All of that could then get washed into our waterways. Uh, up here, um, we've got just some basically garbage that's left out. Um, and most, some of this garbage looks like it has some electrical components too. A lot of electrical components have metals in them that can be harmful. Rooftops are often treated with um, copper to prevent algae growth. Um, and a lot of rooftops are made with arsenic. So that contributes those metals into our waterways. Um, the lawnmower with petroleum products out there, contributor of those polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. We've got a caution sign here with, um, looks like they've sprayed some pesticides dog pooping that could add nutrients and fecal coliform, some trash, person using a storm drain as their garbage can. In any case, this is kind of a, um, just a picture, I think of it as a Where's Waldo picture of um, all different uh, ways that storm water can enter into our system. And I again, apologize for the messiness of that. <laughs> I, don't know what, uh, I don't know what that is on there. Um, in any case, um, so I realized I couldn't do this alone. And a lot of other people are doing stormwater outreach like the city of Bellingham and whatnot. And um, I also discovered that tackling stormwater pollution really needs to happen at the individual and community level, not just at the organization level. And um, we all need to take some responsibility for it. So I basically put together a program to help spread the word about stormwater education, basically what I'm doing now, and also to provide a tool that people can use to understand and be a part of the solution. Um, and for me, I think it's it's just, it's a fun tool. I like using it and actually my um, teenage sons use it and their friends use it as well. So it's, it's open to all community members. Um, it's um, just a fun way to get people involved and engaged and, and looking out for pollution. So there's two goals of this water reporter program that I created. The first one is to educate and actively engage community members to recognize and report pollution in our community. These are the water reporters. And um, it's also to work together with our neighbors, friends, colleagues, city and state agencies to fix and find solutions. So before I developed this program, or I should say while I was developing this program, I um, met with a lot of people in the stormwater department in the city of Anacortes, in the city of Bellingham, uh, Blaine, and I also um, talked to people at the Port of Bellingham and the Department of Ecology. And it was basically to, to kind of get an idea of um, what their experiences are with stormwater and to just learn from them what they've already done, um, some of their ideas, and just to let them know that I would be doing this so that they could either choose to be a part of it or at least be, um, be cognizant that it was happening. So there are three steps to the program. 
<laughs> it sounds kind of like you're entering some kind of a um, different type of program. But anyway, um, the idea is you observe pollution, you document it with a picture, and then you report it. So it's pretty easy in that respect. And traditionally, pollution has been reported by calling a hotline, which you can still do. That's my um, that's my cell phone, which is the Pollution Prevention Hotline at Resources. Uh, you can always email me as well and send me a picture. Um, and then what happens is you would report it to me. I would contact the agency that would be most likely to be helpful in getting it cleaned up. And then I would report back to you to, to say what happened. And that still works and that's a great way. Um, but what I did is I added one more element to that. What I did is I created this app where all members of the water reporter community will be able to see the post when someone posts something. And so this isn't meant to be intimidating. It's meant to engage more people and to educate more people. So if one person posts a picture, they're like, I don't know if this is pollution or not, but this doesn't look right. Like actually one of my sons posted a picture of some really red bacteria nastiness that was in the water. I mean, it looked like red algae. It did, it looked gross. It was kind of mucusy. And he was like, this doesn't look right. And so he posted it on there. And it actually, it made me do some research. Like what is this red stuff in the water? And I learned that it is an iron producing bacteria and that it is a natural phenomenon, but it also can be an indicator that there's maybe too many nutrients going into that system. So it, it's a way to highlight different things that we're seeing in our environment and to learn whether or not they're pollution or not. And if they are pollution, then what do we do about it? You know, how do we get it cleaned up? So by using the app, instead of just using the phone or the email, you get to be a part of the community and we all get to work together and, and talk to each other about it. Right now there is about 80 water reporters that have already signed up and are using the app. So it's, um, I started this program a little over a year ago. So it's a nice chunk of people that are working together and, um, but more eyes and ears and noses, the better. So I um, encourage you to join if it's something you wanna do. I know a lot of um, you are probably really active in the community, whether you're doing your beach cleanups or surveys or just even out walking or biking. Most people I find um, in North Sound Stewards are really outdoor enthusiasts. So you are the perfect candidates to be looking for pollution on your journeys. Okay. So um, to start using the Water Reporter app, just like any other app, you go to Google Play if you have an Android or you go to the App Store if you have an Apple. And then you search for the Water Reporter app. And this is what it looks like. It has a big raindrop and it's viable industry. So you know that um, it's the right one. There's also a um, web page, thewaterreporter.org, if you want to just learn more about Water Reporter in itself. It's a program that's used national, uh, nationally, um, and different people have adapted the Water Reporter for different ways. So I've used the Water Reporter to report pollution, and I'll be actually adding, adding a monitoring program onto it as well. So it's just one way that you can use the Water Reporter. So if you're interested in other ways, um, you can check out their website. So once you've found and downloaded the app, you do have to register. So you do have to provide an email and a, and a password for that. It'll remember the password. Um, you can put in your real name or you can put in Elias if you want. And then what's really important is that you find the North Sound Baykeeper group. Because like I mentioned, the Water Reporter app is used nationally and people use it for different reasons. We wanna make sure that all our posts are, are being um, put into the North Sound Baykeeper community so that we're all working together in this area. So Skagit and Whatcom counties. And then um, the last step then is actually to use the app. And the way you do that is you, um, uh, open up the app and you type, uh, you click on this icon here, the little blue pencil, you click start to post. And then there's four basically steps that you need to do. This icon click basically is geolocating yourself. So you look to see um, where you are on the map and you just basically press on where you are. If you wanna report on the field, it'll find you where you are and you just click that. You can also just go home though later and report it. Um, and then you can just open up the map and find out where the pollution was and then click on it. So either way, it can be in real time or later. You want to take 
um, write an observation or two, like um, big oil sheen on Alabama Hill um, or huge dump of garbage um, in Whatcom Falls Park or something like that. And then the, one of the most important thing is to add an image because if it's something, particularly if it's something that you don't know um, what it is and I can help identify it, you want to click an image and then you'll want to share your post again with the North Sound Bay Keeper group. Okay, so there's kind of four steps. Geolocate, just a word or two, sentence or two, or you can write more if you want, an image, and then North Sound Bay Keeper. And that's it. That's all you have to do. And you can write comments on them as well. So um, if other people post, you can chime in if you have some information to add. Um, as a part of your post, you can also use some hashtags. This way, um, the more people that use hashtags, the more then you can um, call up events like how many people reported sediment issues? You know, how many people um, reported storm drain issues? So it's a way then to kind of get trends over time. So just something else to consider when posting. And then before I go into the details on how to identify pollution, I want to just stress what this program is not about. And um, it's not about getting neighbors or businesses in trouble. It's not about trespassing on private property. It's not being confrontational or rude. Um, and it's certainly not putting yourself in unsafe or hazardous situations. And I just want to take, uh, do a note about private property. And um, we also, of course, need to respect public um, or need to respect private property and stay on public public lands. Um, and two kind of notes about that is that waterways in Puget Sound are public property, meaning that if your boat is floating, you are on public property. But if your boat hits the sediment underneath, you could be on private property. And our private property laws for shorelines in Washington state are pretty complicated. Sometimes on the beach front, it can be mean high high or mean low low. Um, and so it's best just to look for signs. If there's some no trespassing on private beach signs, you'll wanna pay attention to those. Okay. The next um, part of my talk is I wanna um, just give you an idea of what does pollution look like for on land? Like what are some of the things that you should be looking for? Um, and then what should you look for in or near water? And then I'll talk a little bit about um, trash cleanups. But I wanted to just take a little break here and see if there's any questions you had or any comments about what I've presented so far. And I think I'm just gonna stop sharing for a minute. I'm hoping that those little squiggles will go away and then I'll restart a share. Um, so type a question in the chat box or feel free to um, unmute yourself. Right, do we have any questions? I think not. You're doing a pretty thorough job. I feel okay. like I feel like I'm all there. I feel like all I right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think this will get rid of those squiggly lines too. So it was kind of feeding two birds with one scone. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. That's better. All right. Had some like weird uh, screen memory there or something. All right. All right, so things to look for on land, whether you're walking your dog or walking to work or biking, hiking. Um, one thing just to consider is that basically nothing but water should be going down a storm drain. So soap suds are considered a pollutant. And so, you know, if your neighbor's washing their car, um, do you go up to them and talk to them about soap and how it's impactful? Maybe if you feel comfortable about it, um, that's something that you need to decide. And there's different, different ways of, of doing it. We certainly want to have good relations with our neighbors. But there are subtle ways that you can bring it up. Um, one thing sometimes I do is give people a coupon for a car wash and say, hey, I found this car wash. Did you know that you know it's better to wash your car in a car wash? And um, you can give some several just different reasons for that. Um, so this is kind of one of those. Um, 
If people really do want to wash their cars at their houses, um, I recommend people drive their car onto their lawns. Their lawns will filter out a lot of those contaminants. Um, and when I was talking about the coho earlier, they found that a pretty simple filter of sand, um, different types of sands and sediments filter out that additive in the tire dust enough so um, that it that stormwater no longer killed the coho. So filtering uh, fil filtering this um, pollution through our lawns could be very effective, and it also waters your lawn. So petroleum sheens are something that I see quite a bit more than I wish I did. Um, you know, you'll see little sheens here or there and you don't necessarily have to report every sheen, but if you see a pattern, um, like if you see one car in particularly that's always leaking petroleum, it's something to note. If you see petroleum in the harbor and it looks like more than just a couple drops or two, that's also important to note. So it's really about quantity. Ecology won't come out to do a cleanup unless it's like 25 gallons or more. But I think it's still worth noting. Again, we're looking for patterns over time because if we, if we notice one, one little sheen one day out of many years, maybe not a big deal. But again, if we're seeing it happen recurrently, then maybe it's something we need to address. Maybe there's a leaky car that we need to, to talk about. Storm drains need to remain free of debris and unclogged. So anytime you see in your neighborhood that they're accumulating, this particularly happens in the fall with the leaves, take a little bit of time to just brush those leaves off. Um, there are some catchments in the stormwater um, that help to separate some of the dirtier water from the cleaner water. And this just interferes with that filtration system. So we wanna keep those clear. Um, if you ever find yourself in the county and agricultural land, um, sediment is a real big concern. So agricultural um, practices can contribute sediment, fecal coliform, um, nutrients, and also fossil fuels. We really don't want to see cows or other livestock right next to a stream bed. So if you ever see this type of situation, that would be a really great thing to report is cows near the water. They need to be on the other side of this fence, although that might be a road, but you know what I mean? They, they need to be away from the water. We need to preserve our banks so that there's not that input of sediments and nutrients. Construction sites, people that are, um, uh, people at construction sites and doing the construction work need to have permits and the permit requires that they have devices so that this does not happen. So these um, people here are um, going against the, the qualification or the, um, the permit regulations. So they should have some kind of straw bales. So I see straw bales up here, but they're obviously not working. There's overflow. So if any time you see at a construction site that there's a lot of sediment water going into storm drain, that's really important to note too. And um, sometimes what I do is I actually download the construction sites that are happening in Bellingham. So on Ecology's website, they have a system called Paris and you can go and look at their construction stormwater permits and you can download them all in Excel spreadsheet. And particularly following a storm event, following rain, I'll go out and look to see how those best man management practices are. How well are they preventing that sediment from getting into our storm drains? It, storm, sediment, even though it, it's one of those tricksy things, it's just dirt, right? But it is one of the worst types of contaminant that we have in, um, in the Salish Sea. So it's a really important one and we need to just, just keep that sediment on the land and prevent it from going into our waterways. Railroad activity also contributes a lot of pollution. Um, there'll be oil sheens, there'll be dust, there'll be debris, and then sometimes there's even coal. So we need to keep track of that too because they are also violating permits when you see this type of activity. And they, they just have a, a potential to emit a wide variety of contaminants. And as most of you know, the railroads in Bellingham, Whatcom County, Skagit County, they're right next to our, our waterways. So it doesn't take long for this pollution to get into the water. Okay, so those are some of the basic things to look for on land. Um, what to look for on water. 
Um, if you ever come across an outfall pipe, um, the water coming out of the pipe should be clear and have no odor. So if you go up to a pipe and you see that it has a lot of sediment in it or it has a bad, a weird color on it, or if it smells like rotten eggs or fossil fuels, that's an indicator that there's an illicit discharge coming out of there, that there's pollution coming out. So that's important to report as well. Um, another thing to think about with stormwater outfalls is if it hasn't rained recently, and that what and there's water gushing out of the pipe that also means that there could be an illegal dumping of water occurring um, because there should be just a little bit of trickling of of groundwater so this would be kind of a normal little trickle that would happen maybe you know if it had rained within the last 24 48 hours um, but if it had been gushing um, that's a different story Kristen, I'm going to jump in with a question really sure. quick. For me personally, what in under what circumstances would someone be illegally dumping water? Well, so people that are washing things, mm -hmm. like if uh, industries that use water for um, any type of washing, so maybe it's a fish processing um, business that mm -hmm. is um, cleaning off their equipment or just using water to wash their, their fish to prepare it for packaging. That uses a lot of water. Um, a lot of manufacturing practices also use a lot of water. And so um, they are supposed to be containing that water and they're supposed to be filtering it. They have permits for that. So if it's gushing out of there, they could be in violation of their permit and they could be trying to sneak it out into the water without anybody noticing. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, great question, thanks. Um, if you um, are walking in Squalicum Harbor, Blaine Harbor, down in Anacortes, or if you're out on a boat um, and you see uh, sheens, if you see fish kills, um, if you see soap suds, um, that's also important to report. Boat maintenance should be occurring on land. So we want the boats out of the water. We don't wanna see people washing their boats in the water. We don't wanna see them sanding their boats on the water or painting their boats. They are allowed to, boat owners are allowed to um, work on their boats it's a, if it's a very small amount of their boat and if it's out of water. Otherwise they're required to take it out and, and do it where they can um, catch all of the debris that comes from the boats. A lot of boats, I would say most boats, have a coating on the bottom of them, and it's often this color blue here. And these um, paints on the boats have, usually it's copper, and it can be zinc, but they're basically anti, um, anti, um, um, antibacterial or antimicrobial agents. They're meant to detract um, any type of organism from growing on the boat, whether it's algae, like the slime that would grow on there, but even like barnacles that could grow on there if the boat's sitting for a while. So um, we don't want people working on their boats in the water because that zinc and that copper could then get into the water, which is also um, super toxic to fish and other organisms. Copper particularly is toxic to coho salmon. Okay. And, you know, paint chips, um, fish waste, etc. All that stuff is considered pollutants. So in our dust industrial sites, and we have a lot of our industrial sites are located right on our waterways. So we also want to keep track of them and just to make sure that there aren't any suspicious discharges coming from our industrial sites. Um, some of them might come directly from an outfall, others might be just seeping from the site itself. But industrial sites in general contribute sediment, oil sheens, other contaminants such as metals, and also warm water can be considered a contaminant. So um, or industries that use water for processing in, that, in, in the process of processing, that water can warm up. And if they're discharging warm water to um, our waterways, that can be uh, really harmful to the organisms in there. Warm water decreases the amount of available dissolved oxygen. So um, not only can it affect them from a thermal standpoint, but it also can affect them from a respiratory standpoint. 
We also want to take a look at bluff failures and erosion. So um, particularly if you see a new erosion event or if you see an event that's contributing a lot of sediment to the water, um, it's also really important to know to note. Um, if those are private property, um, people need to start, you know, shoring up their um, their their banks to so that that input isn't um, continually putting more and more sediment into our waterways. And foam's kind of an interesting one. I've done a lot of research trying to uh, differentiate natural foam and unnatural foam, you'll see a lot of foam in our waters. Like I've noticed um, lately, Squalicum Creek particularly has a lot of foam. Um, Baker Creek that flows into Squalicum Creek, also a lot of foam. And I've actually talked to the Department of Ecology about it. And to me, it looks like it's unnatural. And the, the reason why I say that is because it's very bright white. Um, I don't smell any detergents in it. I have um, picked it up and looked at it, but it just it doesn't look like the artificial or the natural foam that you see on the left side, um, basically because of the, the brightness factor. Natural foam is caused from decomposition and aeration. And so it tends to be kind of yellower, browner, and it smells like decomposition. It kind of smells like dirt or kind of earthy smelling. Um, when you poke it, it breaks apart in chunks, whereas the unnatural foam tends to stick together more. Um, so these are just things to, to look out for as well. Um, I have a suspicion that Squalicum Creek might be suffering from some um, detergents being put into it because there are a lot of homeless camps there now. And I think people are using that to bathe in. And so I, I found like shampoo bottles in, in the creek. So I have a sneaky suspicion that that might be why I'm seeing that. Um, but, you know, natural foam is not always a good thing because if it is caused by decomposition, that often means there's a lot of nutrients um, that are being input into that system. And maybe those nutrients are coming from agricultural runoff. And so um, I think it's also good to report large amounts of, of nat natural, form, um, natural foam because I think it can be an indicator of too many nutrients in a system. But I think this is just a good example of, um, of, of not really understanding if it's good or bad, depending on if it's natural or unnaturally, and often not knowing what the source is. And so again, this is, it's kind of like a mystery that we just kind of keep adding information to the database and, and hopefully eventually we'll try to, we'll be able to figure it out. So something else that's similar to foam in the sense that it's natural, but maybe not good natural are algal blooms. So algal blooms, um, they can be algae and they can be bacteria, they can be green, they can be red, they can be yellow, um, and they're becoming more and more common in the Pacific Northwest. Um, one of the, cons well, there's two main concerns. One is that some of them are hazardous algal blooms, HABs, and they produce toxics that can make people very sick. They can kill your dog if it swims in it. It can kill people too. Um, they, they can give you swimmers if if you swim in it. So there's that toxic nature to it. But they also create an environment of low dissolved oxygen. So when they decay, um, the, the organisms that are doing the decaying will take up the, that available oxygen. So there's that too. <laughs> so again, this is kind of one of those cases where it's a natural phenomenon, but it's not necessarily a good thing. And they are caused by an increase in nutrients as well. If you see large amounts of garbage, um, please report it. You know, if you find a bottle or two here or there, no need to report that, but you might wanna clean it up. Um, but if you do see a large dump, that, that should be taken care of, particularly if it's along a waterway. And based on people using the Water Reporter app, I was able to create this garbage hotspots of Whatcom County. So um, I took everybody's data and information and um, was able to create a map of where we chronically see garbage in Whatcom County. So um, you're more than welcome to use that map too. And if you do start using Water Reporter, I can add more to this map. I'm hoping to get more places down south as well, because this is mostly Whatcom County. 
Um, back when we're into normalness, um, we offer um, clean out cleanup kits to check out at resources. Um, we're not currently doing that now, but maybe by the summer or the fall, we'll be back to doing this. So you can check out a bucket, bags, gloves, and grabbers, and you can do your own cleanup. Or you can also just grab your own bag and gloves too, and just do cleanup on your own. <laughs> So I encourage people when they start thinking about searching for pollution, I think about, well, why don't we start at your own house? Um, are there ways to make runoff from your house less harmful? Are there um, surfaces that you can change? Can we remove grass and put a shrub? Can we get rain barrels? Um, just basically doing a self audit. And you can also just look around then like your neighborhood too for, um, pollution events just on your, if you go out for a walk, um, particularly now, I feel like I need to make sure to get out and, and provide some Zoom relief. Um, so I go for pretty much daily walks in my neighborhood. And most people are very aware of what's normal and not normal in their neighborhood. So you'd probably be the best person to know if something is not right. And our local streams, um, think about what your local stream is and maybe you want to adopt that and keep a um, keen eye on your local stream. And then of course there's our cities, um, our bays and our parks. So I just want to share a couple examples of um, some success stories of Water Reporter. So um, this kind of um, weird substance was found and um, you can see I reported it, but this was a case that someone actually emailed this to me and then I went down and checked it out and then I reported it. So I didn't know what it was and I did some research and I found out that it was called um, garnet abrasive and it's used to um, clean ships the bottom of boats usually. And like I said before, the bottom of boats can be toxic because of that anti-fouling paint they put on there. So potentially this could have um, copper and zinc in it and potentially some other chemicals. So it was important to clean up. So I did report it to the Port of Bellingham who reported the person, that, the company that leases that land and it was cleaned up within 24 hours. And this was only a, hundred, a couple hundred feet from the waterway. Another example um, was uh, someone alerted me to um, algal growth in Lake Padden. And so I went down to check it out. And um, I had fortunately just taken a hazardous algal bloom class and was able to identify some toxic algal species. So um, I called the city of Bellingham and let them know what I found. And then um, the next day they put um, the sign out there to warn people not to swim in the area, not to drink the water and to keep pets and livestock away. So that was great. That was a good community interaction where could have prevented um, a dog or a person from getting sick. And then um, here's another one where um, uh, the rock wall jetties of Squalicum Harbor, people um, told me that there was a lot of garbage collecting out there. So I went out um, in my new canoe to collect it and I got a boatload of it, um, but there was so much more. So we organized two community cleanups and lots of people came to them. One event we had like over 60 people and they were still left. So then we contacted DNR and they came in with boats and a whole crew of people. And in the end, we got over 16,000 pounds of garbage removed. Much of that was uh, creosote wood and a lot of petroleum products. So again, that was just where, you know, someone noted accumulation of garbage. We tried to do the best we could. Um, and then we asked for some help and so in the end, we, uh, we got a lot of, of material cleaned up. So I uh, just wanna thank you for listening and I really hope you'd consider joining um, the Water Reporter program, whether you download the app or not, or even if you just keep an eye out for pollution and um, feel free to contact me um, if you ever see any pollution or have questions about it. Um, this is a link to our website that has a lot more information. It actually has a manual of a lot of the stuff I went over if you want um, to see, see it in a different format. So there's, um, and some videos there as well. It's kind of our little mini library on Water Reporter. And then, yep, my email and my phone number. And then just to recognize that this program um, was made possible through a grant through the Department of Ecology. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions? Any questions from anybody? 
That was really informative. This is the, I feel like this is my second time hearing it, but this time there's like a lot more new information. So every time I hear this, I learn something new. Good. Great. Um, if we don't have any questions, then I think we're good. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you so much, Kirsten, for giving us this awesome presentation. I will just yeah. reiterate um, that, especially if you are North Sound stewards, but even if you're not, this is a very easy way um, to make a difference. And if you're North Sound stewards, this is a super easy way to get some hours. I am always going on walks because what else is there to do in the middle of the pandemic? So. <laughs> And I'm also always on my phone. So this is just a plug to for sure download the app um, and report pollution when you see it. But other than that, um, Kirsten's email is linked in the chat and it's also on the resources website. So again, if you have any questions about pollution, you can always reach out and she will be happy to help. Um, but with that, I think we will call it a night and thank you all so much for joining us. So you, get, you guys have a good rest of your night. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you.